Hey again, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. I am Dr. Whitney Costers, professor of English, and today we are going to examine Nathaniel Hawthorne's very famous short story, Young Goodman Brown. If you are interested in the analysis of classic literature, then feel free to subscribe to the channel as I have been a college instructor now for almost two decades, and I am so happy to share my thoughts and ideas on literature that you're likely going to read in school or may just be interested in reading on your own. And Young Goodman Brown is definitely one of those texts that is anthologized, read, and taught year after year. So let's dive into it. In this story, a young, naive, good man named Brown from Salem, Massachusetts, takes off on an excursion one evening, leaving his wife Faith behind at home. He tells her, of all nights in the year, this one night must I tarry away from thee. My journey must be done twixt now and sunrise. Upon leaving, Brown tells himself that after this one outing, he's going to cling to his wife's skirts and he'll just follow her up to heaven. This all suggests that Brown may be up to no good from the get-go, as you'll learn that in this story, his wife Faith also represents Brown's faith in goodness, morality, and Christian principles. So he's saying on this one night, he must leave his faith, his wife, but also his religious faith, his convictions of right and wrong. And it's worth asking why this outing must be done in the dead of night. It seems really suspect, yeah? Brown's excursion leads him into the woods, into the unknown and darkness. And it's here that he meets a man who tells Brown that he's late, to which Brown responds, Faith kept me back. Again, we must read this as literal in that his wife does ask him not to go, but also as representative of his conscience that made him rethink committing some sort of questionable act tonight. Now, this figure certainly seems to be the devil. He's a shapeshifter who has taken on the appearance of Brown's grandfather the e this evening. And why, you ask? Well, maybe to trick Brown into believing his ancestors were well acquainted with the devil, or maybe this is the devil's way of informing Brown that his ancestors really were wicked, or perhaps this is just symbolic that Brown is headed down the same dark path that his ancestors once walked. Throughout their walk, the devil tries to convince Brown to join the dark side. And like Jesus, who was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, Brown resists, protesting that he and his family are good, pious people. However, unlike Jesus, Brown eventually is worn down by the devil's attempt to lure him into sin and evil. Throughout the journey, Brown sees, or he believes he sees, um, some of the most pious, devout, and good people in his community. It's important to note that oftentimes Brown thinks these people are present. Nothing is ever 100% certain in this story. Sometimes Brown fancied or believes he hears the voices of his fellow townspeople. Other times we're told that there could be ocular deception due to the light. And don't forget also that we're dealing with the devil who's going to go to any length to see humankind fall. However, we also have to contend with the possibility that the devil is just allowing Brown to see that people, even the most devout Christians, are not as righteous and good as they'd always like you to believe. So for instance, when we see Brown's catechism teacher, Goody Cloyce, fraternizing with the devil and insulting Brown, do you think she's really there and the hypocrisy and wickedness that she obviously never shows in church is finally being exposed? I mean, surely we've all come across at least one or two hypocritical church goers or human beings for that matter, right? But at the same time, Goody Cloyce's likeness may just have simply been conjured up by the devil to trick Brown. As a side note, um, Sarah Cloyce was a woman wrongfully accused of witchcraft in the Salem witch trials. So it's tricky, yeah? You'll notice that Hawthorne puts us in a number of circumstances like this throughout the story in which we must question what is really happening. But nevertheless, what matters is that the devil never forces Brown to do anything. Brown always has the choice to go on or turn back, and he continues to walk further into the woods with the devil. His efforts to resist are finally put to an end when his wife's pink ribbons that she always wore in her cap come fluttering down from the sky. And it's at this moment that Brown knows his wife is there in the woods too, and he yells, my faith is gone. 
So again, his wife has been led astray, but also Brown's faith in goodness and God is gone. And it's almost as though he goes mad in this moment. He flies off like a witch in a frenzy. And we're told that nothing is more frightful than the figure of Goodman Brown. Eventually, he believes he sees his fellow townspeople partaking in some sort of wicked worshiping assembly where we learn one man and one woman, Faith and Young Goodman Brown respectively, will be taken into communion tonight. In other words, this is the night Brown and Faith must make the choice to join or flee the sinners who are all bonded together in their wickedness here. Throughout all of this, Brown still clings to the hope that Faith will stand true to her name and reject the world of sin. The ceremony is treated like this perverse version of a church service. Standing upon a rock like a preacher surrounded by fire, the devil gives a sermon on how evil is the nature of mankind. This is really intense and dramatic, and as the crowd welcomes the two into the communion of their race, Brown tells Faith to look up to heaven and resist the wicked one. And suddenly, everything disappears, leaving Brown totally alone on a calm night. Now, we never know the true nature of all this. Perhaps Brown was dreaming or having delusions, but then what was his errand that he just had to do on this one night? If it was all a dream, was he just hanging out in the forest by himself to think? Did he really have a meeting with the devil who conjured all of this up to deceive him? Did all this really happen? Were all these people really here to convert Brown and Faith? After all, Brown clearly had some sort of plan for the evening, and his wife Faith seems very afraid of being left alone at home. Maybe she begs him to stay with her because she knows that she doesn't have the self-restraint not to attend the meeting. Of course, I mean, Hawthorne is not going to give us any answers or certainties, but what is certain is that Brown is a totally changed person after this. From then on out, Brown is highly suspicious and fearful of his family, friends, and community. He is so distraught over whatever happened the night before that he forever turns into a stern, sad, darkly meditative, distrustful, if not desperate man. This story is an allegory, meaning that it conveys a message through the personification of characters, ideas, or concepts. This is different from symbolism in which a symbol is something that represents something else but is not a fixed representation of it. In other words, it can symbolize a variety of things depending on one's interpretation or depending on the changing context of the story. For example, Faith's pink ribbons could symbolize innocence, youth, or purity, or all these things at once. But in an allegory, the representations can only mean one thing because they are intended to share a specific message that the story sets out to tell. Now, I've already mentioned how faith is the personification of Brown's religious faith, and that's all she stands for. Her significance in the story is not as Brown's wife, but as the representation of his faith that is in jeopardy. She tries to convince Brown not to go, but she, I mean, not her, but rather Brown's faith, is not strong enough to succeed. So when Brown sees faith at the ceremony, it's less important that she is actually there participating and more important to recognize that it symbolizes that Brown is on the brink of forever succumbing to evil. Similarly, Brown is the personification of the everyman who attempts to be good. I mean, his name is Goodman Brown. Now, Goodman was a general title given to men at the time, but it also figuratively means that he is a good man. And it's his good nature that makes him feel so devastated by what he believes is the truth of his fellow townspeople. He may have temptations and he may have gone to the dark side for a minute, but overall he's a good person. So every time you read about Goodman Brown, you're supposed to think about the average person's experience in the face of evil, temptation, and the realization that no matter how righteous, good, moral, religious, or decent of a person one is, everyone is susceptible to evil, wrongdoings, temptation, wickedness, and sinfulness because we are imperfect humans. So I think that this is a story about how evil is interpreted and perceived. Hawthorne is emphasizing the ambiguity of human experience. Now, some argue that Brown loses his innocence in this story, but I don't think he was ever really all that innocent to begin with. I mean, he knows what he's doing from the get-go, yeah? 
He convinces himself even that he can reform after tonight by clinging to his wife's skirts and following her up to heaven. But this is really naive because, as we all know, you can't get into heaven by riding someone else's coattails. You must also wonder if this is a story of a man whose own sin led him to consider all other people sinful. He eventually comes to judge others by himself. He thought them sinful and hypocritical because he was sinful and hypocritical. And if he believes he is so good and righteous but can still be tempted to do evil, then perhaps everyone who also seems so good faces these same weaknesses. What do you guys think? Please share with me your ideas in the comments below. Does this story resonate with you? I mean, do you ever feel like Brown? Have you ever been so confronted with hypocrisy, the reality of sin and evilness that it's changed you? Does it make you feel less guilty of your wrongdoings if you recognize and accept that we are all susceptible to them? Do you think there is a pervasiveness of secrecy and evil around us at all times? Do you think people in general are performing what they want you to see? Have you suffered the consequences of doubt and disbelief like Goodman Brown? Have you felt the demoralizing effects of the discovery that humans are definitely fallible? So many questions that Hawthorne is asking us to contend with in this story. I really hope that you found this lecture useful in further understanding young Goodman Brown, or I hope it has made you consider the story in new ways. For me, I mean truly the enjoyable thing about literature is finding new ways to see and interpret it. And I learned so much from my students and from viewers like you, so I really hope that you will share with me your take on this really frightening, dramatic, and profoundly important story. Until then, please check out my other videos for more lectures on classic literature and subscribe so that you will be notified when the next lecture is posted. And I will see you guys there.